Alex, what can philosophy of biology say about race and the legitimacy of racial divisions among human beings? We can say something, and it's useful about race, um, that um, can help put this issue that race has raised over a century or two, or even longer than that, um, uh, in science in perspective. And that is that the concept of species is itself a vexed one, which doesn't have the kind of grip on the nature of reality that, say, the chemical concept of element has. Mm -hmm. Species is just a term of art of instrumental use among biologists, in particular, um, uh, 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 systematists. And race itself is another word which is uh, equally groundless as a concept that has a grip on reality as opposed to a simply useful heuristic. And in that connection, what we as consumers of biology have learned, us philosophers, is that molecular biology and evolutionary molecular biology teaches us that um, there's almost no scope, in fact, no scope, I'd say, uh, in explanation of interesting features of uh, human populations that require or even adduce the concept of race. What we've learned from particularly the sequencing of Neanderthal genes and human genes across the planet uh, is the remarkable homogeneity of uh, human genetic inheritance and the complete absence of systematic differences that have any material reflection in um, uh, social behavior, human institutions, uh, or even our adaptation to our environment. So for example, take skin color. We understand well on the basis of work by uh, uh, an Australian uh, biologist named Jablonska exactly why people have the skin colors they do. And it has nothing to do with racial origins and everything to do with adaptation for the production of vitamin D on the part of females and adaptation for the um, minimization of the production of too much folic acid among males. So in every human society, the males are darker than the females. And the explanation for this has to do with the males need to minimize folic acid and the females need to maximize folic acid for the uh, health of the infant. And the general basic color level of the skin is itself the result of fine tuning for the absorption of vitamin D. So in areas of high altitude, like in Lapland, where there's almost no sun, there's strong selection for whiteness of skin. And in the Atlas Mountains in the middle of Africa, where there's a great deal of cloud coverage, there's strong selection for the whiteness of skin, okay? And the skin color difference has nothing to do with racial origins and everything to do with local adaptations. Mm. The nicest sort of apparent counterexample to this was the fact that Eskimos have relatively dark skin, not to be expected among in people indigenous to high altitude areas, but Eskimos get their vitamin D from fish. Uh, and uh. that's why they haven't adapted to their local environments in the same way as other people coming out of Africa as we all came out of Africa 70,000 years ago. Mm. So all humans are related to one woman who lived about 150,000 <laughs> years ago in Africa called naturally mm. African Eve. And it's not like there was just one woman alive. There are lots of women alive, but she's the only one that has had an unbroken sequence of female offspring until now so that our mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited only in the females, enables us to trace all of us back to a single origin in southern Africa about 150,000 mm. years ago. Mm. So this is you know, what we understand now scientifically about the non-existence of races as a serious biological category.
Okay, um, you use skin color as one example. So, uh, there are other um, races as we uh, uh, use them in common usage in which there is dark skin color other than um, African Americans, as, as we would say. I mean, there are people in India who have just as dark skin. And or Dravidians, uh, yeah. people in the Andaman Islands. Yeah, there's m yeah. Many, many different things. So, so the skin color is, is one characteristic. The question is, is there a, a, a constellation of of, uh, of characteristics that together make up differential racial groups. The simple answer to that is no. Okay. Um, the, uh, so let's 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 let me ask it this way. Um, you made a, a, a uh, an analogy between the uh, the definition of species and the definition of race, saying that neither. Uh, is grounded in a fundamental reality. Neither, neither cuts nature at the joints, as Aristotle would okay. say. Okay, so are, are they similar at that level? Uh, are they, do they both have that same kind of characteristic? Yes, exactly. Exactly the same. Right, sure, so, because the idea of, as it was introduced, the idea of races was a subcategory of species. Right. Now, species, when over the 100, 200 years since, 175 years since Darwin, Biologists have been trying to propound a definition, a necessary and sufficient yeah, yeah. condition definition of species, because there it is in the book that Darwin wrote on yeah. the origin of species, which sets out the proprietary laws of the entire discipline. Right. And they've never succeeded in giving a characterization of species that fits all the different uses that the mm. word has in biology. Mm. And what that reflects is that the term doesn't have a single characteristic definition that will fit, right? And that's a good symptom of the fact that it's merely a useful classificatory device without actually, as I okay. said, cutting nature at the joints, okay. yeah. without actually dividing the, bio the human domain into real classificational parts. Let me get practical in the question of, uh, of race because it, it it feels better to have no real, to have race not being uh, 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 really? grounded in reality. It feels better. Now that is, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an emotion we should be aware of, and I think that's a good emotion, um, but that doesn't make it right. Uh, what makes it right is uh, what, what is real in terms of the molecular biology and how it works. So let me, let me give you a specific example. Um, if you believe there is really no racial uh, fundamentals, then you would be less likely to want to fund um, medical research for a certain classification of people because that really doesn't exist, the, that, the racial characteristic. But I think data will show that there are certain kinds of diseases that are more prevalent to different groups. Uh, Ashkenazi Jews have a, a, a certain Tay kind of say sex, and that's you know mm -hmm. my, I, I, that's and, part of my. And of course, theory. about ten years ago, the FDA approved a drug called Bidil that was supposed to be particularly effective in dealing with ca cardiovascular illness in the African American population. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it was really just the combination of two drugs that were already uh, prescribably available, and it seems. If I follow the science right, it's turned out that the idea that there are sufficient homogeneities in the genetic inheritance of the characterizable five races of the federal taxonomy yeah, yeah. has generally proved to be unreliable and that there are no such differences. There are, of course, natural bell-shaped curves in the distribution of, of all traits all in various populations. And, they and there are long-term environmental factors okay, that uh, will tend to shape certain genes as more prevalent in some communities than others. So sickle cell sickle disease cell is, is a perfect example of something that's characteristic of African Americans, okay, uh, carried over from uh, uh, the Middle Passage from from Africa, okay? But these kind of traits do not reflect anything distinctive of races. Sickle cell anemia is a, uh, a genetically carried disorder that could perfectly well be manifested in Caucasians, in subcontinent uh, Asians, and in East Asians. It's all a matter of the deletion of a particular gene in a particular, a particular 
nucleic acid in a particular gene. A nice example is the ability to digest lact uh, milk yeah, yeah. as adults, okay? In Lapland, in the far northern areas, because of the need for vitamin D and the lack of arable land over long periods in the winter, there was strong selection for not switching off the lactose protein gene, which enabled babies to continue to consume milk. Mm. Okay? Is this distinctive of Scandinavians? Well, it turns out that the Watusi are in exactly the same position. And in the middle of Africa, these are people who can also continue to digest milk throughout their entire lives because of a mutation that occurred in exactly the same gene as the mutation in Scandinavians. Would you think there's a different di nucleotide in the same gene? <laughs> Would you think there's a difference uh, between men and women in terms of their, um, their fundamental groupings because the same argument about healthcare orientation to racial groups is, off, is often said towards women's health. There are dif differential um, health issues between men and women. So uh, is your claim that uh, those are the same kinds of issues uh, or is the male-female differential based on fundamentals whereas the so racial I think, one's not? You know, most probably we know that uh, uh, in uh, human and in a variety of other uh, metazoan, particularly mammalian species, there are structural differences between the genes. So in males, it's XY, and in females, it's XX in the human case. And there's no doubt that gene expression will vary depending on the presence or absence of a Y or an X chromosome in males and females. And of course, some of the transsexual issues are due, some of them are due to these differences. And the differences, of course, are gonna have ramifications for health and for medical treatment. But I don't think that's paralleled in any way by racial differences.